Good Day Tiagi, otherwise known as Civil Asylum Tiagarajan. And before we start this, I have to tell the audience how I learned to pronounce your name. I have to credit John Swinney, who we both know, who told me, related the story to me about how he was in a workshop with Harold Stolovich, who insisted that before they start the workshop, that everybody learn how to pronounce your name. And that's how I learned it. And that was probably about eh, 20 years ago or something. Now, I first joined NSPI, which is now ISPI, back in 1979, and I attended my first conference in April of 1980 in Dallas. And I'm pretty sure that's where I first saw you. I didn't know you personally, and I think that probably came somewhere in the mid-80s, something like that. Um, But I'm going to ask you if you would please introduce yourself and tell us where you currently live and work and a little bit about where you grew up, because I think that's awfully interesting. At least I'm very interested in that. Uh, tell us about your educational background, where you went to college, what you studied, um, and such. But can you give us a little background on who's this guy, Tiaga Rajan's, uh, Civil Asylum Tiaga Rajan, otherwise known as Tiagi? Beautiful. Guy, congratulations of your ability to apply, transfer, a very important skill. There are only five people. The other four I owe money to who can pronounce my name and spell my name correctly. (laughs) And thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Where do I live now? Uh, Right now, I'm in St. George Island which is about an hour and a half from Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, But my postal address is Bloomington, Indiana. Not to be confused with Bloomington, Minneapolis, Bloomington, California, Bloomington, maybe North Carolina, but Bloomington, Indiana, which I was told, and I really seriously, sincerely believe It is the center of the universe, not to be confused with other cheap uh, Bloomingtons. And that is where I live. Uh, I have been living there. But by the way, I'm older than you. Did you know that? I I guessed you were a couple months older than I am, at least. I'm older than uh, Joe Biden, Donald Trump. Uh, Hillary Clinton. I'm 92 years in this uh, human performance technology business. By the way, that includes my previous life. I don't believe in reincarnation, but in my previous life, I used to believe in it. So I was born the day Hitler invaded Poland. I was born in 1938 and uh, I grew up in Madras, a place which is now being called Chennai and I went to school there. By way of background, interesting thing, my mother was a teacher of mathematics and my father was a headmaster in a government school during the last few years of the British Raj in India. So one of the main formative growing up experience is I got canned in the school by the headmaster. I get canned at home by my father, who happened to be the same person. There was no legal limit of a double jeopardy, so it was a tough. And one of the things my father told me that whatever you do, promise you will never become a teacher. I decided then and that that is the only thing I'm going to be doing. I'm going to become a teacher. So I did my schooling and I went to Loyola College, 
not to be confused with Chief Loyola College in the United States. This is run by the Society of Jesus in Madras, India. I did my undergraduate and master's in physics, uh, nuclear physics, and uh, that, uh, and then I ended up in Bloomington, Indiana. Would you like to find out how I ended up in Bloomington, Indiana? Yes, because I'm interested yeah. in hearing about your story about Reader's Digest and Susan Markle. So is that part of the story? Uh, that is the next part, and that is Chapter 7. Ah. I'm on Chapter 6 I'm now. So, I'm sorry to jump ahead. <laughs> so I ended up becoming a teacher because I strategically failed my degree examination. And if you fail your degree examination, you are unfit for no job other than being a teacher. So that is the last resort of failures. So I became a teacher and I started fooling around with instructional technology. And I ended up doing homegrown instructional technology experiments in my classroom and wrote a programmed instruction manual on the chemistry of chlorine and somebody read that and he was in the Ministry of Education. He sent me a note saying, could you go attend this workshop in Madras which will be conducted by an expert authority on programmed instruction. So I went to the workshop and that evening after the workshop ended, I went to him and I said, that was a good workshop. However, the research you cited is not the original research. It's a replication of a previous research. And he said, uh-huh. I said, the original research if you go to Tabor, Schaefer, and Glaser on page 64, the second paragraph, you will see Waldo Sweet did the research on a second language instruction. He rolled his eyes and kept a poker face. A week later, I got a cable and it simply said, you're right, I'm wrong would you like to be my research assistant? And I cabled back and said, how much does it pay? He said, this was 1966, he said, $80 a month. I did some rapid calculation. It was 4,000% increase in my salary as a high school teacher in India. I said, I'm ready. And I sold my wife's uh, jewelry and uh, we packed a suitcase. We had a two-year-old baby. So Lucy, my wife, and Raja, my little kid, we jumped in an airplane, made a partial payment, fly now, pay later. And it was Swiss Air, and uh, that is how we ended up in Bloomington, Indiana. Well, I went and Dr. Elson, my sponsor, said, hey, go to School of Education. You can get easy PhDs there. So I enrolled in School of Education and then ended up doing my master's in education and doing my PhD in a combination of education, research, and cognitive psychology. So that is my educational background. And since then, I have been learning, picking up new things, things of that nature. I think I have talked long enough in response to a simple question you asked. 
So give me the next question, and I will try to be brief this time. Please don't be brief. This was this was very interesting. I, I thank you for giving us that uh, extended answer. So you were then you taught at Indiana, is that correct? And where Harold Stolovich was your student, and, and I'm sure others, but I don't know who they are. So can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Okay, uh, I did teach at Indiana University, which again is an interesting story. First course I took was some programmed instruction, and I kept thinking, I know a lot about programmed instruction. I always, one of the occupational hazards I had is I always thought I'm smarter than my professors. So I enrolled in this course and the professor said, everybody choose a topic and do a programmed instruction module on that topic. So when it was my turn, he asked me, Arthur Babbick was his name, he asked me what he want to program. I said, I want to program your entire course because it makes me hypocritical to have a course on programmed instruction, which is being taught by somebody talking from the front of the room. He thought, okay, do it. And I ended up uh, writing a book called A Programmed Approach to the Programming Process. And uh, that he used parts of the book the first semester to teach his course. And then he said, next semester, you know more than I do, you teach the course. So that is how I ended up doing, teaching a course on programmed instruction. Not officially, I didn't get paid, but it was a lot of fun. So that is how I ended up doing things at the Indiana University, the beginning of the second semester. Mm-hmm. So Harold Stolovich was one of your students, is that true? Oh, yes. He, uh, he turned up uh, a couple of years later. Mm-hmm. He tells a so. story of you taking five or six students to NSPI conferences. In your, they'd all pack in your car, he told the story. you drive to exactly. the conference, you'd all stay in your room, and that's how they, uh, he got introduced to NSPI, which is now ISPI. But uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, how often you did that and what are, who are some of the people that you brought along? Uh, my initial foray into NSPI, ISPI. So um, the year after I came, I wanted to write a proposal to make a presentation at the NSPA conference. Uh, Dr. Babi was uh, my professor said, usually they reject 90% of the proposals. So you should safeguard your chances by writing three proposals and maybe one of them will get approved. So I wrote the three proposals and all three of them got approved. So Babbitt said, okay, I can give you a ride. You can stay in my room. And I said, that's great. And I was worried about what we do for food. So ordered a suit, uh, had a suitcase full of uh, Campbell's soup, thick manwich soup. And so we had bean soup. So I stayed in Babic's room, opened the can of soup and uh, without diluting it or boiling it, ate it raw. So I existed on bean soup for three or four days which was a danger. And that was how it all began. And I kept going to ISPA conference every year. Before Harold came, I had a job as an instructional designer. So 
they paid me to go to ISPI. That's when I packed up other people and said, you all can come with me. And we drove and they stayed in my room. We had extra sleeping bags and things of that nature. Very good. That's a very interesting story. So you, you, so, so when did you start your own consulting firm? Were you still with Indiana and then kind of segued from that into consulting? Or tell us a little bit about that story. <laughs> okay. This also goes to NSPI. The first year I did a session on how I designed a programmed course on programmed instruction and replaced the professor. And so somebody came to my session and I had spread parts of my program book on program instruction. And he took a look at it and he said, that's great. Can you come and conduct a workshop to my trainers on how to design program instruction courses. I had no clue what was involved in this. I said, okay. He said, we will pay you $100 a day. I said, wow. And then since uh, I did not have any previous experience, went and uh, talked to one of my classmates, his name was Alan Shepard, not the astronaut, but close enough. And he said, step one, do you have a jacket? You've got to wear a jacket if you go and conduct a workshop. So that day we opened our piggy bank and bought a light blue uh, jacket. And so I called my potential client and said, I need somebody to help me. Can I bring another person? He said, fine, we will pay him a hundred dollars too. So Alan and I drove on our car and the first client was uh, a large defense contractor company mm -hmm. out of that in Milwaukee. So we went to that and conducted the workshop. And then it dawned on me, $100 a day is greater than the graduate assistant salary I'm making. So I let people know, among other things, I'm a consultant and I can do things. And um, sooner it got to the extent I get consulting gigs more, uh, which were time consuming and not a thing and it was more exciting. So I reduced my official Indiana University time to half time and started doing consulting. Very cool. Thank you. So your first in the previous video that we did, which is 10 years ago, we did that at, the, at one of the ISPI conferences uh, back in 2009. And we talked a little bit about your first exposure to human performance technology, which is the label that ISPI gives it. And of course, ASTD, now ATD, calls it human performance improvement. But you made the comment that back in the old days, we used to call it PI, performance improvement. But so when did you uh, get introduced to that beyond programmed instruction and looking at a broader array of the variables of performance? Can you tell us a little okay. bit about that? Yep. Uh, that is nothing beyond the programmed instruction. Everything is programmed instruction. PA actually stands for programmed instruction not performance improvement, okay. but uh, just to make uh, people happy, we called it whatever they wanted to call it. So 1963, probably before you were born, I read an article called How to Learn Twice as Much in Half the Time. 
it was in Reader's Digest, reprinted by Saturday Evening Post. And I went to the U.S. Information Library, tracked down the original, read it, and it basically said, you can, there is a new thing called behavioral psychology, and programmed instruction, and this is how we can do it. And I checked it, they showed a couple of examples of frames, which is an exotic term. So I decided to imitate it, and that is how I started doing it. And as I was doing it, um, there was somebody working for the U.S. Agency for International Development, and he was doing some program instruction, and he said, oh, can you do some program instruction for me? And I said, on what topic? He said, family planning and contraceptive techniques. I said, good, I'll be happy to do that. And did a program manual on a program guide to happy families, it was called, a program manual on contraceptive techniques. And that was one of those early exposures, and I was a great believer in evaluating everything, testing things out, and long-term evaluation. Uh, as a result of working on this area, I have only one kid. Mm -hmm. And my son has only one kid. So not only do we preach other people how to reduce your family size, we actually have applied it and practiced it, and we are following whatever we did. So that is my first exposure to human performance technology, or in the good old days, programmed instruction, where even in those days, people were talking, Joe Yeni and some of the other people in those days were talking about the importance of application transfer, following through, and not just teaching, but maintaining your behavior change and all of those exotic things. Mm -hmm. So besides Joe Yaney, who else would you say are some of your major influences, uh, influencers from back then? Uh, the Michigan group in those days, I don't know where they are, but uh, uh, our friends all came from, Dale Brathover was from there, and so the, the people in Michigan was there. And the other major, major influence was Susan Marker, was working at the University of Illinois at Chicago Circle during those days. I met Susan Marker in India, where she was conducting a workshop on program instruction. I was invited to attend it, and I showed her the stuff I had created, and I said, name a page on good frames and bad, I will tell you exactly what is on the top left-hand corner of that page. I used to have a photographic memory those days, I was showing off, she said, okay, you're not going to be able to use me as a teacher of programmed instruction, but I'm a subject matter expert on contraceptive techniques. How about that? I said, that's great. And she ordered a copy of Lettuce Books on contraceptive techniques, and they were shipped through the U.S. Embassy diplomatic pouch because some of them were probably, uh, would have been censored or withheld 
or something like that. Mm -hmm. So she taught me a lot about programmed instruction with a specific project we were working on. She was a major influence. Another major influence in the area of programmed instruction was my first professor at Indiana University School of Education, Arthur Babic, and he's the one who said, if you're that smart, you want to take over my job, be my guest type of a thing. So Babic's approach was very simple. He's a great believer in giving people enough rope. So he said, you can do whatever you want. And the other major influence was Douglas Elson, who was, uh, uh, who replaced B.F. Skinner as the chair of the psychology department at Indiana University. Not too many people knew Skinner was at the Indiana University. So Doug Elson was a remarkable behaviorist and he did an approach called programmed learning and in contrast to programmed instruction. His approach is you can program the teachers of reading, elementary school reading. Instead of programming the book, you program the teachers and I was working in that area. Among other things, Doug Elson said, this was in 1968, uh, I was reading some stuff on learning styles in those ancient days. We took a look at it. This is what they teach in the School of Education. This is stupid the techniques, the strategies we use in making people learn actually transfer from mice, pigeons, dolphins, and human beings for somebody to claim that there is a difference between a right-handed learner and a left-handed learner, it is ridiculous. So good learning technology, good learning techniques are the same throughout all human beings, throughout all sentient animals of any kind, and that is something I remember. So Douglas Elson was one of my influence, and obviously that was, uh, I was later on editing ISPA journal or NSPA journal and there was a couple of co-authors. One was Swanson and the other one was Wallace. Wallace and Swanson. They kept cranking out articles once every week and they kept sending it to me. And I read every one of those articles they were very smart people. I don't know which of those two was the real brains behind. But uh, so that was another thing. And Bob Mager was another major influence. Uh, the first year I went to NSPA Journal, I saw him going on the elevator. I said, can you please shake your hands? I want to tell my fellow classmates, I got to shake hands with Bob Mager. And he was tickled and it was, uh, he was always a very interesting, sarcastic person. Every year he, at NSPA, he keeps asking me, when are you going to learn English? <laughs> That was his running joke, and he was very influential in in the field. And so those are miscellaneous people who inspired me. But the guy, actually, the people who really inspired me are people who come to my workshops later on. For example, 
in San Diego. I ran a workshop on instructional design and interactive instructional design. At the end of the workshop, somebody came to me and said, I would like to translate your manual into French. This person, I was almost tempted to ask him, when are you going to learn English? <laughs> this person, this, I said, okay, no problem, go ahead. He said, how much should I pay you? I said, nah, no need to pay. Let us see if we get published. Six months later, he had the manuscript ready, he had a publisher, the manuscript got published, and during the next six months, it outsold. Even now, it's out outsold the English version of the book on interactive learning design approaches. So his name is Bruno Hurst. He's, he invited me to come to Paris and conduct workshops, and I was in Paris uh, a month ago, and I have been doing it for the past 16 years. So it is amazing to me how other people are able to take the concepts and the principles and use it, translate it to that language, to that environment. So all my friends, according to Lucy, my wife, all my friends are from the workshops I attended or the workshop I conducted. I don't have any other social life. So I have a friend in Switzerland, a friend in Beijing, a friend in Singapore. These are all people who are in my work workshops and later on uh, organized my workshops in different countries. So these are people who influenced me. I, I know that you are all over the world, literally, delivering workshops, and I'm, I'm glad that you are able to keep on spreading the technology and helping others to grow and develop in that. Uh, let me shift gears here to my next question, which is, if you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do, what would that elevator speech be? It is to change people's accomplishments, results, behaviors efficiently, effectively, and enjoyably. So that is the first 10 seconds. The second 10 seconds, anything you do, do it with other human beings. This is because I'm a sociopath, I'm an extreme introvert, so I preach to other people what I should be learning. I tell people, other people are important, they matter, and everything you do, you should do it in a participatory mode. You have to be a learner before you can teach other people how to learn. You should let your learners teach you. Uh, so my approach is participatory performance technology, participatory learning, participatory organizational design, participatory everything. Do it with other people so if things go wrong, you can blame them. <laughs> well, you know, interestingly enough, in my notes here for our call today, I said in 2008, you talked about doing HP I via participation. So it's it's good to see that you haven't lost your way and you're still on the same track. Thank you for those elevator speeches. I didn't know if this was going to be a two-story building or a hundred-story building, but uh, you did that quite succinctly, so thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, can you share with us what your current focus or next focus is on your own learning as a lifelong learner? Good. I'm always inspired by the great Hindu physicist Niels Bohr. Bohr said, the opposite of every profound truth is also a truth. 
So if somebody said, participation is the only way, I ask myself, what is the opposite of that? Never participate. How can I prove that? And one of the things recently I was told is a good trainer is a storyteller. And I said, there is something suspicious about that. And I did some introspection on storytelling. I remember back in Madras, long time ago, when I was uh, 19, I went to a wonderful political presentation and listened to the politician who was running for the election, and he told a series of stories. And one of the stories he told me is how the Muslims in that community have been killing and murdering Hindus. He gave vivid details, and before I know, half of the listeners of split up, went out and beat up the Muslims they can see within their eyesight. It suddenly occurred to me, storytelling is effective in a bad way. It is a dangerous thing. You put people in a trance mode, you give a bunch of lies, you give a bunch of truths, and you highly motivate people to apply whatever they learn, which is good as long as what you're teaching is moral, ethical, valid stuff. Then I started doing webinars because my client said, our president of the corporation says, we should do everything. Oh, did I jiggle? Oh, you're good. My, you're good. Uh, I told, um, a client said, my president wants everything to be done online, should be done in webinars. So I said, how do I do a webinar? And suddenly it occurred to me, I tell them stories and I have them spellbound. So I told them a lot of stories, doesn't matter what topic it is, begin with a story, end with a story, have a story in the middle. And at the end of this session, evaluation smile sheet, what is the most important, interesting, and memorable thing in the webinar, everybody said it was stories. At that time, one of the graduate students came to me and said, I have to do an evaluation project. Do you have anything I can do? I said, no problem. I'm doing a webinar. Can you do follow-up evaluation? And a week later, he came back and said, I got good news and I got bad news. I said, give me the good news. He said, they all love your stories. They remember it, they repeat it, they have memorized it, they tell it to their colleagues, they tell it to their family members, wonderful. Okay, now give me the bad news. He said, everybody loves your stories. That is the only thing they remember from your webinars. I asked him, that's an interesting story. What point did it illustrate? They say, we don't know, but it's an interesting story. Don't you agree? So every time we tell a story, people forget what happened after the story, what happened before the story, but they remember the story. And it suddenly occurred to me, I'm doing it the wrong way. I should not be telling stories. They should not be listening to stories. So I came up with the concept of interactive storytelling. Everything should be participatory. <clears throat> so I told my students, you guys come up with the story. 
here is a sample story of what makes specific objectives more useful than vague terminology. So, okay, now you make up a story, or if you have a story based on your background, now exchange your story with somebody else. So, I met people create stories, lie, cheat, do stories, do what most trainers usually do, which is make up stories and make it sound like they have discovered the principles of nirvana or something like that. And then I said, okay, even if I tell them a story, I should stop the story in the middle and have them complete the story. Or I should tell a story <coughs> and tell them, we are today talking about cultural diversities. So if the same story happened in Japan, how would it have changed? Or I told the story, here is a story from an American consultant and he drives in a street, a policeman comes and stops him, he pulls out a local currency bill to bribe the policeman. The policeman looks at the money and throws it back at him and talks loud. He says, okay, money in inflation. He asks his local guide what he should do. Guide says, give him 200. So he gives 200 to the policeman and the policeman looks at it and puts it back in his pocket. So this person gets uh, tired and he backs up the car, turns around and leaves. This is the story of the U.S. consultant. Now, write the story from the point of view of the policeman. But this is something which really happened in Mogadishu. And here is the policeman's story. We tracked him down and asked him what happened. He said, I was standing in a one-way street and this white guy, strange guy, drives in the wrong direction in the one-way street. So I stop him. He gives me some money. I thought he gave me money for the policeman's benevolent fund. So I gave it back to him and they said, take it to the police station and they give it to them. And they gave me more money and obviously was not understanding me. So I raised my voice and said, thank you, we appreciate that, but I'm not authorized to get any money. At which time this man very rudely backed his car and ran away. So folks, here is the same story from two points of view. This is Rashomon. So can you come up with the story as a team? Give it to the next team. The next team, can you rewrite the story from the point of view of one of the characters in the story? So the point I'm trying to drive across is different people have different realities and so on. So the whole idea of interactive storytelling in contrast to you telling story and the people following you and saying Sigheil and the things of that nature. So that is one of the things I'm doing right now. And the other thing I'm doing is uh, any training you do, you start with an open air. So I thought any meeting you have in your organization, why not having an opening session, opening activity for the meeting? So I'm cranking out a set of 50 short opening activities to prepare people who are attending a meeting so they could be more collaborative, 
more oriented on the outcomes, more focused on the agenda and things of that nature. So that's the book I'm currently writing. I'm on activity number 38, 12 more activities. I'm ready to publish it. It is called Unknown. <laughs> well, I'm sure you'll come up with the title, but um, that I, I, when we talked earlier today, you told me that you were writing a book currently, but you're, you're, you talked just now about your interactive storytelling and, and doing webinars, and I wanted to ask you about your four-door webinar, your approach to designing. Could you t t talk to us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, one of the things I realized over the past 92 years is when you do instructional design, the only person who, lo who learns is the instructional designer. Because the learner, the stuff has been pre-digested, it does not learn anything useful because he's not actively pursuing, processing the information. So I thought if you're doing instructional design for e-learning, maybe we should have people more involved. So the four-door learning approach has four doors, you log in, door number one says library, and you go inside, all of the content material is available in the library as a videotape, as a PDF file, as a boring lecture, whatever format you want. Uh, one of the things I learned in 1965 in Program Instruction Day is the concept of adjunct programming, which basically says you don't have to do step-by-step -step programming, give a book for the people to read, and then ask them a series of questions based on each chapter of the book. So I said, that's a great idea. So the library door in our e-learning, you get to read anything you want in any sequence you want, chunk it any way you want. And if you get bored or if you learned everything, you go to a playground. The playground has a series of video games, games for stuff which is close to questions, like questions on terminology and things of that nature. So you can go there and play. It measures your understanding of all of the information you got from the library. To prevent people from just memorizing close to questions, short answers, we have another door which leads you into the honky tonk or the cafe or whatever you want to call it, forum. And here you are asked open-ended questions like all the objectives should have conditions, standards, and behavior. Of these three, which one do you think is the most important one and why do you think so? These are questions for which there is no correct or incorrect answer. You want your folks to think about it, look at it, and things of that nature. So that is the forum approach. And the last door opens to what we used to call a torture chamber. We now euphemistically call it performance testing area. Here, you're given a scenario-based simulation performance test, not require you to recall, but here are 18 objectives. They are not stated in the right form. You Can you rewrite them so they are acceptable? And take one of your own topic, write objectives. So the four doors are library, playground, 
cafe and the torture chamber or assessment center. So that is how we are doing. We just crash through this quickly, produce a rapid prototype and as we more and more people uh, go through it, we keep enhancing, steal some of the better answers and throw it in and say, okay, here are some of the answers given by other people to this open-ended question. Use it as a model, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a, I'm going to shift gears here now, and I want to explore some of the terminology uh, within the profession. And my question is, is there a favorite uh, performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you feel that others are misusing it, or you'd like to clarify it, or you'd like to emphasize it. Is there one in particular that you can share with us? I keep pushing the concept of playfulness okay. as an intervention, playfulness as a process step. And by playfulness, what I mean is being able to improvise. And as we tell people, if when you build, you, you should be designing an airplane when you're flying it. When you're doing your instructional design, you should be delivering it. The concept of somebody is the designer, you are the deliverer, is inappropriate. You cannot be a good deliverer. So improvise, be playful. Playful in the sense that your objectives, your activities, your content, everything keeps on emerging as you do it. This is designed to drive the epic people crazy. <laughs> You don't plan. You just uh, jump in and uh, start uh, teaching. And uh, as you keep uh, delivering your training, you keep tweaking it because you cannot really, really find out what will work and what will not work in, unless you do in situ design. You design while you are delivering it. So my approach is use it as a process in human performance technology, meaning keep changing your objectives, your goals, your content as you go along. I'm also training people to be playful. So if, for example, teamwork is your topic, Approach it in a playful mode. Don't uh, tell people there are four steps in being a team, developing team. Just uh, tell them, build a bridge, and at the end ask them, okay, when you were building a bridge, who took over the charge of making the plans. How did different people assume different roles? Did they have a lot of fight in the beginning or in the middle? Things of that nature. Let people do things and debrief them to get the content. That, uh, that causes me to want to ask about another phrase, one that I learned from you. You may be stating it differently now, but you back in the 80s and early 90s used to say that all learning happens in the debriefing. Is that, do you, do you still say it that way or do you, have you changed that a bit or? Yeah, I definitely say that. Uh, and I have expanded on it, a guy. You got content, you got activity. Good training, good instructional design should harmoniously integrate content and activity. Content without activity is inert knowledge. It is useful only for a PhD dissertation, totally useless otherwise. At the same time, activity without content is equally stupid. It is simulating a headless chicken. So you need to have both content and activity. 
there are three ways you can combine them. One is you do the activity first and debrief them to derive the content. Another one, you give the content first and do an activity which will force them to use the content. And the third one, you do training, stop it in the middle and ask them, what did you learn? What would you like to learn? So you can combine content with activity either before or after or during your training session. Unfortunately, you cannot do it any time in between, before, during, or after. That's it. So Quite restrictive. That is... <laughs> yeah. But so, exactly. so what? So if you were to give some quick guidance to people about debriefing and how to facilitate debriefing, what what, what would you share with them? Okay. <clears throat> First, I will tell them don't debrief in certain areas. If I'm teaching, well, by the way, you can debrief anything you want. I can have you eat a peanut butter jelly sandwich and teach you the meaning of life used on the experience. Did you mindfully pay attention to the seeds of the grape in the grape jelly, which was in the guba jelly? And did you do the same kind of... So you can debrief anything and everything, but debrief only to achieve a goal, an objective, a learning outcome you want to come. Just because you're a psychological peeping Tom, don't keep saying, who did you hate during the bridge building activity? What made you get jealous about them? That is none of your business. You have a specific objective. So one thing, and I think it is partly due to what uh, I have been doing and what Matt has been doing, telling people always debrief. People are gone gung-ho on debriefing and they debrief things which don't need to be debriefed in that particular content. So I tell them, focus on your goal, your debriefing to achieve your goal. And having said that, I tell them, here are seven steps you can use. Begin by asking people, how do you feel about what happened and about the process? Then ask them, what happened during the activity? Ask them, how does the activity relate to what happens in real life? Ask them, what did you learn? Every activity is constrained. So what if we did the same activity for two days? Or what if we gave the winner $2,000? So you ask, what if question? And finally, how would you apply what you learned from this activity to your real life back in the workplace? So it is simple, logical. Here are five questions, six questions you should be asking. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Yes. That ding dong in the background says I've been talking too long. Is it time for us to shut up? No, it is not. It's time for us to go to question number seven out of eight with a bonus okay. question at the end. This is when, when I smile and hold my smile for four seconds. Yes. No, <laughs> but no, we're not, we're not to that point yet. So okay. one of the things that I wanted to do was to, to bring alive, keep the memories of people who may not uh, any longer be with us, people who are deceased, mm -hmm. so people from the past, or people who are still alive. But, but So what I'm looking for are yes. some stories to make, to humanize them. So yes. you've been uh, around for a long time, being 92 years young, and you, you know a lot of the, the people, the gurus, or perhaps people who never reached the status of guru, um, but who you might share some stories with us to keep their memories alive. I, I don't, we didn't talk about this beforehand, so I don't know who might be on your short list, but if you have two or three people that you could tell us a little human story about, we'd appreciate it. 
Susan Marker, who was somebody I talked about, mm -hmm. is unfortunately passed away, and she was my mentor. And one thing I like about Susan Marker, how smart she was, and at the same time, how humble she was. She did not want to be called a guru, and she was willing to share every, a lot of things. Same way with Douglas Elson, who was not a long-term ISPA member, but a very knowledgeable person, who was able to tell me, you're right, I'm wrong, would you like to be my graduate assistant? And unfortunately, most of the people in ISPI, from the time I started doing things, um, are no longer with us. So I will tell you about my death. Okay. And I have in my part, this is my, this is my retirement plan. I want to drop dead in the middle of one of my workshops. And I have in my, I tell people at the beginning of the workshop, just so they are prepared, inside my left hand jacket pocket, I have the debriefing protocol. It has a series of questions on death and dying. And what is it about <coughs> death? What we should know about death? And how do people say, ah, oh, you will be reborn. And how do people cheat themselves by saying that is eternal life? I tell people these questions are written from my religious approach, which is total militant atheism. So when I drop dead, somebody read the question, have a thoughtful discussion about that, and whatever you want to take it from that, that's a valuable experience. This is one time only type of an experiential activity. So that is what I plan to do. And I'm hoping you don't kick your bucket before I do. Now that you're replacing your body parts one by one, <laughs> I'm sure you'll out after me. Yes, well, I, I'm not sure what I did to abuse my knees, but yes, I did have two knees replaced earlier this year. All right, so thank you for, th for that story. And uh, um, I don't know, I think I want to go before you. I th and you might outlast me too, because you've not had to replace many body parts or any. Um, I, so I wanted to ask you, we exchanged emails a little, uh, a couple months ago, and I was looking for some of the short stories that you had written for your son, Raja, back, oh, you have seven stories that you wrote, and they used to be on your website, and you found a Word document with them and sent them to me. Are those going back on your uh, website, or might I share them when I publish this video? Okay. You can share them, preferably posthumously, but I think you probably will edit the video soon, so I hope I don't uh, disappear. Oh, please uh, feel free to share them. Okay, because I remember finding them on your website, and and I was really yes. intrigued by the dusty elephant story. And I won't go any further and explain that, but that uh, that was the hook that got me into reading them all. And this oh, is good. this is a long time ago, I think, that I saw those. And I went yep. looking for them months ago and couldn't find them on your website. So I don't know why you're hiding things. Uh, you know, once the back, government finds out I... you're hiding things, they're going to be all <laughs> over you. But uh, Yeah, exactly. So let me wrap our interview here with uh, thanking you for participating in this video interview. And I, my final question is, for the people that are new to the field, you and I have talked about people new to the field over the past several decades and you know what they're looking for. And there's a lot of us uh, who have been around for a long time and we, we don't seem to be, collectively, we don't seem to be meeting their needs. Um, but do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for those people that are new to the field related to 
performance improvement, programmed instruction, et cetera? One of the requirements that used to be in the NSPI is if you want to become a member or if you want to become a human performance technologies, you should not have a sense of humor. If you laugh or if you smile, you are immediately disbarred and defrocked and whatever words you want to use. Uh, to me, my advice to people in the field is lighten up and have fun because ultimately your goal is to increase the amount of laughter among the performers. So go for it, forget everything else. Thank you for those words of wisdom. And thank you for all of your contributions over the, uh, the past 92 years. I wish uh, you uh, uh, much happiness and uh, success in the next 92 years, whether that's in this life or in your next one, even though you don't believe in, uh, you'll, be, you'll be coming back, you've done it already, so why do it twice? But uh, yes. thank you so much for the uh, interview today, and uh, good luck in writing your and finishing your book. Thank you. And you know what I'm going to do now? I'm going to say cheers and smile and hold the smile for four seconds. Four. <laughs>